astrolabes and lexicons once in the great houses. A poor lobster man met by chance on Swan's Island where he was born. We saw the old farmhouse propped and leaning on its hilltop on that island where the ferry runs. A poor lobster man, his teeth were bad. He drove us over that island in an old car. A well-spoken man, hardly real as he knew in those rough fields, lobster pots in their gear, smelling of salt. The rocks outlived the classicists, the rocks and the lobstermen's huts, and the sights of the island, the ledges and the rough sea seen from the road, and the harbor and the post office. Difficult to know what one means, to be serious and know what one means. An island has a public quality. His wife in the front seat in a soft dress such as poor women wear. She took it that we came, I don't know how to say. She said, not for anything we did. She said, mildly, from God. She said, what I like more than anything is to visit other islands. Like Eros, the poem we began with, the particular backward glance of the word once the tale-telling connotations of it launches a story of value once there were astrolabes and lexicons in the great houses. In Eros, recall, it was the young telling an old man that they'd heard of his generation's militancy, which the poem implies will one day return, not through any messianic inevitability, but because they form part together of the human tongue that will speak. Here, that word once distinguishes the ob objects of early capitalist elites, the astrolabes and lexicons, from the working class object world and working class language, lobster pots and mild speech and soft dresses and bad teeth, which the poem implies lie closer to the perplexity of humanness than the tools of mastery do, that it's somehow more real. That the rough fields of this main island and the perdurable rocks make the lobsterman aware um, that he is hardly real, the poem suggests, is a nobler thing than either the acquisitive mastery that led to the so-called age of exploration or the experience of pseudo-reality in the industrial cities, which, like the houses here, are great in that negative sense particular to Oppen. To be hardly real and to know it is to be kept honest, kept modest. If the poet worries that it is difficult to know what one means, given that the rocks confront us with a baffling endurance, given that the objects predominate, there is at least the consolation that there are two kinds of objects that baffle us, those produced by nature and those produced by human domination, and that the first kind of bafflement yields a common speech unlike the meaningless chatter of the spectacle, unlike the clockwork of the world. And that commonness of speech is what links the speech that rises against all odds from the housemanized boulevards and squares of paved over Paris on the one hand, and the tattered hillsides and ramshackle agoras of the little islands on the other. Across his career, Oppen keeps his lexicon restricted in order to navigate and to give us to feel a low level perpetuity of sonic gaming and transvaluation that if it doesn't add up to the promise of a future victory over capital per se, insists on seeing birth continually emerge out of recombination. And I think for Oppen, that sonic gaming is, as the title ballad suggests here, the song of the people. <laughs> 